impossible not to actually during this talk. Uh, you know, a long time ago, I, I felt a lot of, of kind of unease actually because who, who I am and who I, I'm hardwired to be. Um, I didn't feel resonated with the kind of, as my mother used to say, laissez-faire attitude in the United States. You know, um, the United States has always been a funny place. Uh, you know, it's like the land of Hollywood and all these very risque things, yet in a second it turns into, you know, this very, very puritanical, you know, seemingly moralistic place, but it, it's, it's like a, always been this kind of uh, incongruence. And maybe that is what democracy should be. But I think that, that you know, what we've seen over the past several years is um, the allowing of the genie out of the bottle actually of what has survived in the underbelly of the United States throughout. Um, and I'm talking about the, the incredible racism. Um, I mean, in my lifetime, and this is just the preamble, I guess, to the talk, in my own lifetime, I grew up in a, a small suburban New York town, a 30 minute train ride from Manhattan, New York City. And uh, in my lifetime, Jews were not permitted to join the Larchmont Yacht Club. In my lifetime, uh, people who lived in certain places in the town were not permitted to, attend, to, to use the beach there. I could not use the beach in my own town because I grew up in an apartment building on a side of town that was not permitted access to that beach. I mean, this is unconscionable when you think here, you know, everything is public, but there it's not like that. And it's, it's loosened over time, but there are still issues with private beaches and things like that. And, and, you know, certainly in my elementary school, there were very few people of color. You know, it, it just, it was always like that. There was uh, uh, integrated busing going on in my lifetime, uh, in the lifetime of my children even, who are now, 29 and, and 27, there was a uh, talk of bringing children in from the city of Hartford. I lived in Hart uh, West Hartford, Connecticut, and you know, people in, in our little suburban enclave, uh, which was also a little upscale neighborhood, uh, you know, freaking out that children from the city would be, would be uh, coming into the school system. So there is that kind of, you know, I want what's for me and everybody else go over there kind of a thing. It's always been there. Um, it's, it's never been, uh, in many ways, it's, it's just like South Africa. And I think that I, what I feel is that even though here things were very institutionalized and uh, clearly, you know, there was a difference between apartheid South Africa and uh, democratic United States. Uh, the point is that there are bits and pieces of this society here that that existed in the United States all along and continue to exist. And, and one of them is the Native American reservation system, which, you know, if you've heard me talk before, you've heard me talk about my daughter who, who uh, has been working for six years, almost seven years, uh, teaching in the Native American community, community, including living on a reservation for four years. And then really that was a big eye opener to what the homeland situation is in the United States where, again, you have a separate medical system. You have schools that are, are you know, not supplied federal schools, public schools that do not get teachers of the same value that other, other schools get. So it, you know, there's a lot there. It's a very big unwieldy experiment. In many ways, it's a beautiful idea, um, whether in the end, We'll see, you know, I mean, now we're on the brink of something probably very difficult and, and dangerous. Um, we'll see how the United States comes through. Uh, but anyway, so I think I will start now. I, I did, uh, so sorry, hold on. Um, okay. So as you all, probably know the, the iconic Statue of Liberty in, in the New York Harbor um, with its, its uh, Emma Lazarus poem at its base saying, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it is iconic. It's, it, it's one of those things if you were a New Yorker that, you know, it was a uh, part of our city and, uh, and still is. And you, know, you tell where you are, you're driving in New Jersey and you see the lady with the lamp with her, her hand up high and you know, what 
the, just the symbolism of freedom right there in the, the northeasternmost uh, large city of the United States. So the Statue of Liberty appeared in the New York Harbor on June 19th, 1885, a gift from France. Uh, that was where we were and this is where we are now. This is a, a, a piece of, of uh, art uh, by, I think her name is G. Bochet. She must be a, a French woman. Um, and this is pretty much how I feel. So I did want to mention that my, you know, today I will be talking emotionally um, because I'm not a, a politician and I'm not a, a political science fundi. I'm interested, but I, you know, I'm speaking as Nancy, the American who's very disappointed and upset. Um, so what happened? As you know, I mean, even here in Cape Town, we had a sister march. Uh, I, I would say that, that uh, the igniting of activism is probably one of the, the best things that happened during the Trump administration. People became uh, lit to, to take to the streets as they never had in, in decades it hadn't existed, um, including those of us who live overseas. I mean, I was part of that, uh, that here in Cape Town also. And you know, in two weeks time, we, we uh, organized something that drew a thousand people to march from, from uh, the company's garden to, uh, to the parliament building on the day of the inauguration. Uh, but really, you know, they're protesting things that have happened over the past four years in these photographs. But really, as I said, those things have been going on for much longer and they've been kept down. And um, I think now what we see, especially with Black Lives Matter is, uh, you know, people saying, I'm not gonna take this anymore. And rightfully so, you know, when George Floyd happened and the, the man with the knee on his neck uh, died. It's uh, you know it can't go on like this. It it just can't. And and uh, so people are 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 being much more vocal than they were. Of course, they're being counteracted by the far right, which unfortunately, you know, as we we as Jews, I think, are on alert to this a little bit more. It's happening worldwide. It's not a unique thing to the United States. Uh, that in and of itself is very frightening. Um, I think my, my issue with this far right kind of seeping into everything in, a, in I think a very clear way is that because I have the family history I have and because my father was who he was, I mean, he was the sole survivor of his own family. Um, and, and he lived because he listened. He listened to the speeches that were uh, in the early uh, Hitler time, you know, and, and he heard Goebbels, I think, talking about the way Jews would be treated. And he said to his parents, you know, we, we must get out of here. And my grandfather said, no, you know, I'm a veteran. It's the typical story that you hear. I fought in the German army in World War I. They won't touch me. This is my homeland. I'm not going anywhere. And of course, my father did go and uh, they all died and, and he survived. So through that, and, and one thing that he really kind of, uh, it was, he had lots of mantras. I mean, he spoke a lot about loss and I, I think it was part of how he, he came to terms with um, his own trauma. Um, he talked about listening and reading between lines and how important it is to do that always. Um, and to not just take things at face value, but to kind of just see what the fine print might say, or, you know, what isn't being said. And so for me, Fortunately, I have, I have that in me, you know, from him. And all along, I've been saying on Facebook and to friends and to anybody who will listen, you know, this is smacking of what happened in, in uh, pre-Hitler Germany. Oh, no, it's not. How can you say that? You know, people, I think, don't want to revisit that era. Of course, none of us want to, but I think we have to be aware that, that um, history does repeat itself always. And, uh, you know, the United States is no different than any place else, certainly. I think that it is amazing the amnesia that we as humans seem to have that, that we can't remember the, the, the little nuances that lead to these things that are so um, heinous in the end, you know, and it gathers steam and it, and it builds and then you have what happened last week in Washington. But um, anyway, so, so I have, you know, I've been constantly alarmed. Uh, I have never once in the past four years felt uh, safe for myself when I'm there and, and Tony, my husband, and also for, you know, uh, our children, our respective children. My two children 
uh, live in capital cities now, both of them. One lives in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the other one lives in Denver, Colorado. You know, as I sit here, I, first I can't get to them anyway because of the kind of time we're dealing and I haven't seen them in over a year, as I'm sure, you know, many people here have that problem. That's okay, I can accept that. But, uh, you know, they're there and they live in capital cities and now there is a uh, concern that the capital cities will be facing rioting. So it always, uh, it feels sort of heavy on a daily basis. But anyway, you know, I think it's interesting to me that, that for someone like me to have come through this uh, almost 60 years of life and, and really kind of be aware of what these sort of foreshadowings can be, I cannot understand how people get blindsided to this. It, it's very frustrating. And, uh, you know, I mean, we've had a lot of uh, conversations with Americans who will say the system will correct itself. Don't worry, the system will correct itself. Um, and my my uh, feeling has been throughout that, you know, only a, the only kind of system that could correct itself is an intact system. And uh, when a system is no longer functioning in the way we think it, it is, because maybe we don't know or understand, then of course it can't function. And I, I really think that's what we saw last week too. I mean, my Washington DC, you couldn't as much as like spit gum onto the sidewalk without somebody racing over and telling you, you know, you, you can't do that. Or, I mean, it's an exaggeration, it's not true, but you know, I mean, honestly, any of us who have been into that building in our lives and have been in that rotunda and or anywhere know that there, it's very secure. You you can only go in there, you know, in, in in groups and it's it's monitored and all that. So for this to happen is just, I don't know, I felt, oh, there's got to be an inside job here because how does that happen? You know, but I think that is what Donald Trump has done. He's eaten away like a cancer at the fabric of society. And then the unfortunately, the the um, political parlay that's going on uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, I mean, my husband and I always talk about how South Africa has like, I don't even know what the number is, but let's say 40, 48 different people running for presidency when there's an election. The United States has two. I mean, which is really a reflection of a more democratic uh, system, you know? And so it all becomes very, uh, it's a game in many ways, and it's very that is also very frustrating, driven in large part by cash and alliances and all that stuff. And that's of course what we see when we see these these uh, political party members just banding together. You know, they don't think they can't think for themselves. Seemingly, they they're not, and I don't even think sometimes they're thinking about the people who they have been elected to serve. You know, it's uh, it's really disheartening. Some do, but. It, it is more about uh, furthering their own careers. You know, certainly we've seen that over the past week where somebody like Ted Cruz from Texas, who before Trump was elected, he was running against Trump and then he had nothing but bad things to say. Then he became like this lapdog uh, over time and continued to be a lapdog until last week. And all of a sudden miraculously has had a turnaround where he also feels that it's not okay. I mean. It's, I don't know how you guys feel being from here and, and not having any, you know, uh, official connection to the, to the United States outside of interest. You know, to my mind, this is just like, I feel like it's all a reality TV show, you know, all of it. I feel, and, and, it, and that disgusts me more than anything else. You know, I think that, that um, it just has been enraptured in, 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 things that, that create falsehoods. And it's not just what, they've, what he has done with fake news and, and the driving of that machine. It's everything. It's, it's a country you know, reliant upon Hollywood and what um, Hollywood chooses to portray as, as life you know, and escapism and all of that stuff. And you know, I don't think that the average guy, middle-class uh, man and woman is, is living that dream. I don't, you know, oftentimes, People say, oh, you know, don't you want to go home? And I have to basically say, I, I actually am home. This is where I live. You know, I mean, I live here in Weinberg and South Africa is home now. It's been home for, for 15 years. Um, and I, I don't want to go to the birth home. I feel like, uh, you know, it's, it's confusing actually. 
in the birth home at, at present. And I think uh, even the, those certainly, of course, you know, most people that I know from the States, as one would expect, you know, they're, they're thoughtful, they're interested, they're engaged, they, they want to be involved. But even those people, you know, it, it was much more passive involvement than I think what you have uh, had here in South Africa over time. Maybe some of you were involved. I mean, certainly I have friends here who were involved, uh, very involved in, in the struggle and, and detained and all of that stuff. I mean, I, I was never detained. I went to lobby in, uh, I, I went to the state of New York Capitol as a student. I organized a, a busload of students to protest and lobby the state legislature on uh, budget cuts. I went to a, a public university and they were cutting budgets and we were going to lose programs. So we went there and we lobbied and we all thought, this is incredible, look at us, you know, really, I mean, okay. A handful are probably involved in that way, but most are not. And most are armchair liberals and that sort of thing. So uh, what has Donald Trump done in the past? Oh, so here, I'm sorry, a little glimpse of, of immigrant family life. I, I felt I had to, I always feel like I have to bring my people into the story here because it's, uh, you know, of course my parents are a very uh, big part of who I am. Um, but this is all, this is, this is actually from a, a, a talk I gave probably two years ago for the CJSA. Um, you know, civic involvement and patriotism. My father was a guy who, he fled Nazi Germany. He, you know, people say, oh, they caught the last boat. But actually I think my father was on the, one of the last boats because he arrived in January 1940 and the, um, the borders were closed uh, two months or three months later. Um, he quickly naturalized uh, and then went back to Germany as an American army soldier and fought. So he is, can you see the cursor? I hope, okay, so this is my father. Yes, we can. So that's him, that's him, that's him. Of course, that's him and that is him. I mean, we bear a little bit of a resemblance, I think. Um, but he, uh, he was a proud army veteran. He took it very seriously. My father was actually a Republican, believe it or not. Um, my mother was a Democrat. I used to say, I don't understand how this works. You know, I mean, it's like having a, a mixed marriage. You know what I mean? It, any vote is, is contradicted and, and means nothing. And so I learned early on because I think because they chose those different parties. I mean, my father, I think, felt that the Republican party, and I think a lot of people probably still feel this, the party of the, the country, but it's not true. You know, they're both parties of the country, but you know, somehow, even when he came, the Republican swing was where he went. We had a flag on every car that we owned. It was a little decal in the window. Um, he always wore a little flag on his lapel. He was incredibly proud. I think he was as much uh, as he really, really uh, suffered with the loss of his entire family um, in Auschwitz and in Theresienstadt. He, he was grateful that he survived. He was grateful to the country you know, that, that preserved him and, and uh, saved him. Um, but it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy life for them in the States. It was a lot of rebuilding. They met in the States. They didn't meet in Germany. They were 12 years apart in age. Um, but anyway, so here we are. Uh, this is the American Legion post 347. Uh, Larchmont, New York. This is uh, every little town has a little, it's like Jewish war veterans, except for this was non-sectarian. So they were Jews and Christians and everybody, not, I don't think any blacks uh, or any other people of color. Um, but in, uh, in the United States, uh, the last Monday of the month is designated as Memorial Day. So this is the Memorial Day Parade. So I also marched the Memorial Day Parade. As you can see, this is, I was a bluebird. Uh, that graduated into a campfire girl. It's like what you had here as uh, girl guides, I guess, or scouts. Um, we had uh, brownies and bluebirds. And it's interesting, I just am coming to this right now that I, I was not a brownie. And maybe the reason I wasn't a brownie was because my mother maybe made some association between the brownie uniform and, and Germany. I had never thought about that before until just now, but this was, we were against the tide. There were fewer uh, bluebirds and there were brownies, but uh, I was a bluebird. Um, I marched in the parade too. And here you can see me on my, my decked up bicycle. This is Memorial Day. I mean, it doesn't get more American than that. You know, it's, uh, 
it, sorry, there's some ruckus going on on the street here in Weinberg with dogs. So if you can hear that, that's what's happening. But uh, I, uh, I decorated my bicycle every year. I even had red shoes, as you can see, and a little red plaid skirt. And uh, it's a big deal, you know? Uh, we were memorializing the war veterans, you know, and, and uh, Tony was reminding me that, that in Maine, where we go sometimes, uh, we've been there on Memorial Day. It's, it's very sacred actually, because it's a very small island town. And, and uh, I'm really apologizing our street has been very quiet during lockdown, but not so at the moment, of course, because that's Murphy's Law. They should be passing soon. But so, uh, so in this small town called Vinyl Haven, they read every single person's name who- The police is coming now. Oh. The police is on the way. Sorry. The police is on the way. My husband is screaming that the police is on the way. Sorry, I apologize. Um, but we, uh, you know, it is very sacred. And this happens in Larchmont too. My father would, you know, they, they're marching here with the, the rifles. But what happens at the end is they go to this war memorial and they, they, uh, they do a salute and they, they fire their, their guns into the air and they cry and they list all the names of the people who have, uh, have uh, died at the hands of, uh, of war throughout time. Um, okay, so, so uh, hold on for a second, please. Tony? Can you move out of the way, please? I know, but I we don't we don't want the phone call to be part of this this conversation here. I'm sorry. It seems that something actually quite substantial has happened on our street. Um, so, what has happened in the past four years under Donald Trump? Uh, these are this is not everything. Certainly, I uh, I chose these are just things that I came up with. We can talk about it a little later as well. Oops, sorry. Um, from the start. Uh, in 2015, when Donald Trump entered the, the, the presidential arena uh, as a candidate, he was demonizing people. His rhetoric was always demonizing. He, he was uh, vile when it came to, I'm sure that some of you saw, he, there was a, a, a disabled reporter, journalist that asked him a question. He mocked him and, you know, contorted his body as though he was a cerebral palsy victim or, or you know, whatever, it was horrible. And, and he did this throughout with, with anybody who had weakness, Donald Trump, you know, uh, illuminated the weak, weakness uh, with veterans. John McCain is the great example. This man was a prisoner of war that uh, in the time at the end of John McCain's life, you know, Trump was calling him a loser. I mean, Trump who never set foot in to any battle situation and was uh, disqualified because of his bone spurs, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy. And, and I think in large part, you know, one has to say that, that Donald Trump, okay, so he has a problem and he has been a big problem, but he also, uh, you know, was used by the conservative uh, Republican party in the States to fashion a situation that they have wanted for years. And I think um, one of the big fears in the States, even though they, uh, they, sorry, they, uh, they, I'm not sure that they would admit this, but they, there was a, a some sort of a census taken or a study that was done several years ago where uh, they said in, in 2040 or something, uh, white people in the United States would be a minority. And I think that amongst the conservatives, this is incredibly frightening. And then we see a buildup of people who own guns. Of course, there's a whole issue with the right to bear arms and, and everything else. And, and uh, you know, Trump manipulated that. I mean, Trump himself is that person who I'm sure would not uh, like a country that, that is predominantly of color, even though, you know, certainly in terms of reflecting who the indigenous people of the country are, uh, we know that they are not Caucasians. Uh, he, 
he's he he and the party, the Republican Party, have worked very uh, like hand in glove in that aspect. You know, they maybe they didn't agree with him, maybe they didn't agree with his tactics, but they he was getting them what they wanted. So it was all about them and all about all of these men and women, I suppose, who have these aspirations inside of themselves that, that don't actually have anything to do with, uh, I think, what the, the real backbone of the country st stands for, what we would hope it stands for. They, uh, it's all about themselves. And you know, I think that ego, as we probably well know, is the, is the demonizing force within in any situation. I mean, even in a marriage, you know, I mean, if, it's, if the ego drives it, we're in trouble. Um, and that is how he operates. He has a, obviously an ego problem. And the, the powers that be, you, I think, enjoy, have enjoyed using his ego problem to uh, move things in the direction that they wanted to. Um, so what else? Fake news, uh, the undermining of the free pen, uh, press. I mean, if this wasn't ex an example of, um, of what happened in Germany, I don't know what was. You know, I mean, it just the messaging of of uh, getting the you know just just demonizing the press constantly and constantly and constantly and and to the point where people, I think, good people who who maybe they just don't understand that they have to fact check or how to fact check or what are reliable uh, sources and things like that. They believe. I mean, I know people that I grew up with who I watch. I don't I don't defriend on Facebook anybody, because I want to see what people are saying. I want to see what they're thinking. And, you know, like now there's a woman, she, we grew up in, in that town together that I spoke of. She's also from an immigrant family. She's all worried about free speech. You know, oh, Twitter has banned Donald Trump. I'm concerned about the first amendment. And I'm thinking, you know, somewhere in there, they're not understanding there are, there are, are um, companies, you know, private companies involved with that and they have the right to monitor. And, and, and now of course, Twitter, you know, they all loved it until last week. They loved it because it put money into their own pockets. I mean, it's all the same cycle of consumerism in a way. And at least that's my angle. They loved it. It put money in their pockets. All of a sudden it became too inflammatory. That breaking point of people crawling into the Capitol building and five people dead was too much for those countries to identify with. And now they have distanced themselves. I think it's, in a way, it, it's laughable. It's like a little, too little, too late. It should have been going on all the time if they actually cared about society, but okay, better late than never, I suppose. Uh, Donald Trump hardly had any press conferences according to the to the the way it has operated with the presidency in the past. And, you know, I mean, look, I haven't always agreed, obviously, with presidents, people like Reagan and, and the Bushes, I, I, I didn't like them at all. But, you know, you could, you could listen to these press conferences, you could listen to uh, journalists from, from every possible, uh, well, not every possible, you know, an assortment of different uh, and balanced, I would say, uh, uh, agencies asking questions and, and hear how they answer. You make your own choice. It's, it's like what I said to my parents when they were the Democrat and the Republican. You know, you've got to read what these people are actually thinking and just, you can't vote on party lines. I think it's ridiculous, actually. You've got to understand what they stand for and not just the, the badge that they're wearing. But um, anyway, so he undermined that. He, he had hardly any press conferences. Of course, COVID has changed that uh, slightly. Um, he's had press secretaries that, that are, you know, I mean, one after the other, they've gotten increasingly worse as time goes by and, and now it's just crazy. I mean, uh, but this whole COVID situation, as you well know, I mean, it's totally mismanaged. Almost 400,000 people have died. He's more concerned about what his ratings are and, and all of that stuff than he is about the rest of us. So, and certainly, you know, the people that live there. Um, so the press conferences that have existed, he has used as a, a bully pulpit. Um, the so-called Mus Muslim ban. Now we're being entertained. I'm sorry, we have a new puppy. This is our, one of our, our things that has occupied us during, during lockdown. So if you hear her, that, that is Tandi. But anyway, uh, the Muslim ban, demonizing Muslims, you know, at every possible juncture, uh, 
the border wall, uh, the whole angling against Mexico and undermining of, of all of that. I'm not saying that, that their borders were, were what they should be. You know, I mean, I did feel um, that things were kind of loose. You know, as somebody who travels quite a bit uh, to and fro and has to come in through the airport there and comes, goes into various airports, sometimes as a German citizen and, you know, certainly as a, as a South African permanent resident, understanding the, the rigor especially even here. I mean, I don't know how many would agree with this, but I mean, for me here, I mean, if you don't have the right paperwork, forget it. And, you know, there it's, uh, it's always seemed kind of uh, funny in a way and, and not as tight as I would have thought it should be. This is in the, in the past many years, of course, it's, it's upped its game now, but so I, I'm not saying that they shouldn't tighten the border posts, but when you talk about a wall, and you make the wall all about, you know, separating us from them. There's a different psychological message that gets sent. And, and he was all about isolationism, as, as we probably all well know. Um, he has dramatically changed uh, the relationships that the uh, the American government has has worked very hard on over years with with in terms of dis diplomacy. Um, I, I understand that there are some issues in terms of spending and things like that, but I don't trust Donald Trump. You know, I don't think that he does anything really for the people. I think um, a lot of his choices are driven by his own personal investments and, uh, and so forth. Um, separation of families uh, at the border, uh, keeping children in cages. This is still going on. Now they, they've lost they, they, they can't match over 500 children with their parents. I mean, what does this remind us of? You know, I mean, it just, it, for us as Jews, it should kind of sound a few alarms about our own history. Um, the, the move of the embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. So, you know, Tony's son-in-law is a um, Israeli who works for something called the Israel Democracy Institute. And so when this happened, I said, Jesse, you know, what is your angle on this move? And he said, you know, of course, Israel, to Israel, Jerusalem is the capital. So in and of itself, it's not, it's, it's a truism that Jerusalem is the capital. He said, but with the inflammatory things that, that go along with the Trump administration, everything else, and what is going on in Israel that isn't really kosher, there was no negotiation around it. It just happened. And it happened, to my mind, because it made it, uh, you know, very nice for Donald Trump and the Republican Party to have the the uh, uh, Jewish money from the states of people who vote based on Israel and nothing else. I mean, we have friends who they vote based on on what it means for Israel. My angle has been, you know, the Jewish lobby is a very good lobby and it's very secure. And let's 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 uh, allow the Jewish lobby to do its job with government and let's vote when we vote for what is best for the United States. So I, that's where I may not agree with some people even on this, in this session, but that is how I feel. He's replaced many, many judges on the federal level. Sorry, I keep on thinking that I can do things that I can't here. Um, replaced many judges on the federal level with conservatives. That's part of the Republican agenda that he has uh, so handedly used. He has uh, replaced three Supreme Court justices. Of course, the Republicans helped with this. Um, you saw recently at a time in previous administration when Barack Obama uh, uh, put forth a, a, a Democratic uh, nominee to the Supreme Court to fill the Scalia vacancy, you know, uh, they were told, no, you can't, you can't, it's too late in the process, you can't, it must be done by the next administration. Of course, they reversed, you know, they're very two-faced and they reversed that this time. And so he has, uh, for them, replaced three uh, uh, justices, including most recently, of course, the Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg with uh, conservative judges. Um, there was a defunding of, of Planned Parenthood as an example, but other things as well. Um, he has stoked to the extreme right. Uh, he uses scare tactics around freedoms being taken away regularly. And that is what they what they do. You know, you're going to lose your freedom of speech. You're going to use your lose your right to bear arms. And as if the right to bear arms, I mean, this was constructed at a time early on when, you know, things were different than seemingly they should be today. Uh, but now, of course, we see what it has enabled. 
um, amongst other things, school shootings and a lot of innocent people dying. Uh, and that is pervasive. The scare tactics are pervasive in, in his reign. Um, he's had no plan around COVID-19 and this has been disastrous, absolutely disastrous. Uh, and then also has undermined science. I don't know how Dr. Fauci and Dr. Britz actually kept it together over all this time. These are you know, devoted scientists who have regularly been undermined and only now are finding their own voices because I think he's got, he's so much of a bully that everybody has been scared. And, and even now we see that, that um, you know, I think the Republicans that support him probably are also very scared. Uh, and he did of course the deal of the century with warming relations in the Middle East. If you talk to people who are involved in a lot of those things, it's not, not a bad thing obviously, but many of those relationships were being nurtured over time. Uh, I'm not sure it was Jared Kushner's uh, big construct. Uh, anyway, and, and also it comes with other funny little uh, strings like uh, the selling of, of weaponry and who knows what. And, you know, again, look, South Africans well know arms deals and things like that. So, you know, I, I think the, the American government is probably as corrupt as any government. So none of us really know the story. Um, so we've gone from, from all of that uh, stuff and the loosening of what people think is okay to this. This is last week. I, I couldn't find the picture, at least to use here. I, I will credit this is from the New York Times. Um, I chose this uh, photograph because this man here with his long beard is wearing a sweatshirt that says Camp Auschwitz. And, uh, you know, in the like subline, it, it was like the Arbeit macht frei. Uh, byline and then on the back of his shirt apparently it said staff um of course there's another uh shirt that was worn uh that stood for six million were not enough you know let's go back several years where there was that that uh protest that happened where the proud boys had their tiki torches walking in the street and you know he was asked trump to denounce that and he chose to say there are good people on both sides. Well, here, here are the good people. They were in the Capitol building last week um, and five of them died. Uh, so that is, that is where we are at. Um, sorry. Um, I don't know. I have a seven minute video of uh, Arnold Sch Schwarzenegger that I would like to show. Um, as Jewish people, I think it is valuable to see. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to show that now, and then we can talk for a few minutes after that. I would like to say a few words to my fellow Americans, to our friends around the world about the events of recent days. Now, I grew up in Austria. I'm very aware of Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass. It was a night of rampage against the Jews carried out in 1938 at the Nazi equivalent of the Proud Boys. Wednesday was the day of broken glass right here in the United States. The broken glass was in the windows of the United States Capitol. But the mob did not just shatter the windows of the Capitol. They shattered the ideals we took for granted. They did not just break down the doors of the building that housed the American democracy. They trampled the very principles on which our country was founded. Now, I grew up in the ruins of a country that suffered the loss of its democracy. I was born in 1947, two years after the Second World War. Growing up, I was surrounded by broken men drinking away their guilt over their participation in the most evil regime in history. Not all of them were rabid anti-Semites or Nazis. Many just went along, step by step, down the road. They were the people next door. Now, I've never shared this so publicly because it is a painful memory, but my father would come home drunk once or twice a week, and he would scream and hit us and scare my mother. I did not hold him totally responsible because our neighbor was doing the same thing to his family, and so was the next neighbor over. I heard it with my own ears and saw it with my own eyes. They were in physical pain from the shrapnel in their bodies and in emotional pain from what they saw what did. 
it all started with lies and lies and lies and intolerance. So being from Europe, I've seen firsthand how things can spin out of control. I know there is a fear in this country and all over the world that something like this could happen right here. Now, I do not believe it is, but I do believe that we must be aware of the dire consequences of selfishness and cynicism. President Trump sought to overturn the results of an election and of a fair election. He saw the coup by misleading people with lies. My father and our neighbors were misled also with lies. And I know where such lies lead. President Trump is a failed leader. He will go down in history as the worst president ever. The good thing is that he soon will be as irrelevant as an old tweet. But what are we to make of those elected officials who have enabled his lies and his treachery? I will remind them of what Teddy Roosevelt said. Patriotism means to stand by the country. It does not mean to stand by the president. And John F. Kennedy wrote a book called Profiles in Courage. A number of members of my own party, because of their own spinelessness, will never see their names in such a book, I guarantee you. They're complacent with those who carried the flag of self-righteous insurrection into the capital. But it did not work. Our democracy held firm. Within hours, the Senate and the House of Representatives were doing the people's business in certifying the election of President-elect Biden. What a great display of democracy. Now, I grew up Catholic. I went to church, to Catholic school. I learned the Bible and my catechism and all of this. And from those days, I remember a phrase that is relevant today, a sermon's heart. It means serving something larger than yourself. See, what we need right now from our elected representatives is a public servant's heart. We need public servants that serve something larger than their own power or their own party. We need public servants who will serve higher ideals, the ideals in which this country was founded, the ideals that other countries took up to. Over the past few days, friends from all over the world have been calling and calling and calling me, calling me in distraught and worried about us as a nation. One woman was in tears about America, wonderful tears of idealism, but what America should be. Those tears should remind us of what America means to the world. Now I've told everyone who has called that as heartbreaking as all of this is, America will come back from these dark days and shine our lights once again. Now you see this sword? This is the Conan sword. Now here's the thing about swords. The more you temper a sword, the stronger it becomes. The more you pound it with a hammer and then heat it in the fire, and then thrust it into the cold water, and then pound it again, and plunge it into the fire and into the water. The more often you do that, the stronger it becomes. I'm not telling you all this because I want to become an expert sword maker, but our democracy is like the steel of this sword. The more it is tempered, the stronger it becomes. Our democracy has been tempered by wars, injustices, and insurrections. I believe, as shaken as we are by the events of recent days, we will come out stronger because we now understand what can be lost. We need reforms, of course, so that this never ever happens again. We need to hold accountable the people that brought us to this unforgivable point. And we need to look past ourselves, our parties and disagreements, and put our democracy first. And we need to heal together from the drama of what has just happened. We need to heal, not as Republicans or as Democrats, but as Americans. Now to begin this process, no matter what your political affiliation is, I ask you to join me in saying to President-elect Biden, President-elect Biden, we wish you great success as our president. If you succeed, our nation succeeds. 
We support you with all our hearts as you seek to bring us together. And to those who think they can overturn the United States Constitution know this, you will never win. President-elect Biden, we stand with you today, tomorrow, and forever in defense of our democracy from those who would threaten it. May God bless all of you, and may God bless America. Okay. So, uh, there you have it. Um, uh, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the uh, governor of the state of California from 2003 to 2011, eight years. Um, he is the most recent Republican governor of the state of California. Um, he has been an interesting character. I've been following him for a while, uh, not just now. He, he has been very vocal and he has held uh, uh, like retreats where people can talk about the, the essence. You know, it's, it's interesting for somebody who made his name as an actor and was Conan the Barbarian amongst other things and the Terminator himself. And of course was part of that whole Hollywood machine. Um, you know, to, to kind of go at the essence of, of what the problem is. And as he says, which I really do believe, it, the work is not done. So in the late night here, probably close to midnight, I watched this vote. Um, the vote was to impeach uh, Donald Trump for a second time in his presidency. Uh, he always likes to be, you know, the first to do everything. So of course now this is a first for the, the history of the country. Uh, President. Uh, impeached twice. Uh, the most important thing here, and I think there was actually one more Republican that, that came over, this must not be the final vote, this photograph. Um, I, I believe there were 10 Republicans that crossed over, which is, you know, it's, it's not a lot, it's very big, uh, because it will take that sort of crossing over um, and people abandoning, as he said, their party affiliation for the benefit of we the people, as I like to say, uh, as our constitution starts with, that's a fam the famous line, uh, toward a better America. But I, I really think, you know, it's not over. Um, it's not gonna be over for a while. I'm very frightened. I'm very frightened for my children. As I, I said, they live in capital cities. Um, the next five days is going to be critical in terms of this. Uh, but, you know, uh, because of, of the way it's gone with the lack of gun control and, and nurturing of, of uh, far-right extremists who are not particularly interested in, in uh, having, I think, conversations around these issues. Uh, you know, we may see really problematic things happening in all 50 states. That's what's expected. There's, of course, been a lot of uh, bolstering of security now for the inauguration next week. But uh, anyway, so that is it for me. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed my, my musings here. It's a uh, something I feel passionately about, even though I sit across the ocean. Um, and as much as I would like to say at times, you know, the, uh, the, the country doesn't resonate with me. One thing that I've had to confront about myself uh, in my years in South Africa is that although I was raised in a European home, although I have German citizenship, um, although I live overseas, I, I, I was raised in, in that culture. So I am an American, you know, and I, and I have been acculturated as an American. So I have that conflict inside of me. So thank you all. And uh, I suppose if anybody has any questions, don't ask me nuances about political things because I'm not sure I'd be able to answer, but I'm happy to entertain any people's thoughts. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I know that it was really a personal anecdote and, and how you're feeling but I think many of us are also really um, concerned about what's going in, in, on in the States. Um, would anybody like to ask any questions? Or just say anything, Re respond to what, she's, what she has said, I, Philip. I would first of all to say thank you very much, Nancy. As uh, Diana said, it was a very personal encounter and I, I think one needs to hear it. I think emotions shouldn't often be taken out of things and sometimes it it does affect the way one does look at it and one can't always be objective so congratulations for being so upfront about things 
the thing that struck me was, don't worry, the system can correct itself. No system can correct anything. It takes people to make it happen. So it does take people to stand up and be recognized. And that is not always the comfortable scenario. So as in South Africa, we had those people who were brave enough to do so. Uh, it did take 10 Republicans to be brave enough to do so. But then I don't think it's always a case of bravery when it comes to politics. It's probably thinking about their future, their future ability to be reelected. So uh, politics is always that horrible spot of compromise. So it's never straight up and down, right or wrong. It's what actually will benefit me personally that will help me make the correct vote. But thank you. It really, I think all of us are concerned, should be concerned, because populism is not particularly something we should be supporting or not be aware of. And knowing our history, as you point out, we should not be conscious of. So thank you for a very enlightening talk. Pleasure. And you know, I agree with you that the the there's a laziness almost in the system will correct itself. You know, I mean, we have to be that that change. That's what they say, be the change, right? So, it, and it, and that requires risk. You're right. And change makers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else like to add anything to the to the morning? If I may, Ivan Jaffe over here. With pleasure. Um. I'm Louis Jaffe's son, and I've been living in the United States for 32 years. I'm here in Cape Town with Louis right now. Um, I think one thing, I think it was a great talk and appreciate it, and thank you, Nancy. Uh, one thing that we're missing, I think, is that the system is the people. And the leaders reflect the people of the United States. And that's the thing that scares me the most, because you have opinions, both in leadership reflected from the population that are everybody else's opinion and not their own. People can't think for themselves. And I'm talking in generalization, but 70 million people voted for Trump. That's a huge piece of the United States population. I would submit that this population in the United States is a controlled population by the media and certain levels of leadership. Uh, very few less than half of them will think for themselves. And that's the thing we really need to be afraid of. How we fix it, I don't know, but it's certainly something that every one of us should be thinking about. And I'm most disappointed in a very large Jewish population in the United States, especially amongst the Orthodox, who once again display just that, their own interests, and then uh, opinionated information that was not their own and it's not thought out information it's stuff fed to them something to think about i thank you for the talk and i'll say i'll sign off you know i, I totally you, agree with you. actually i you know I, i'm so, i'm glad that you brought that up because um it's one of the reasons i don't choose to isolate myself on facebook i guess or twitter or any of those things from people who don't think like me um i think that it's really important i mean I, there are tons of people who say they're deplorables. I won't label people like that. For whatever reason, people are feeling that pain inside of them and then you're seeing the acting out. And I think we need to get to the heart of that. That didn't happen only in the past four years. That's been building over decades and decades and decades, maybe even hundreds of years actually, you know, and nurtured in various different ways. And you're right. You know, I mean, these are, it's not a, it's not a small number and there's a lot of work to do starting next week, you know, to bridge that gap somehow and to heal somehow. I don't, I don't know it, but it's, it's gonna take a lot of hard work. So thank you for raising that. It's absolutely a part, it should have been a part of this hour together. Thank you. I see not, Marlene, you nodding your head. Have you got anything you'd like to add? No. Anybody else want to say a few words? Please feel free. Unmute yourselves, or if there's anything else you'd like to chat about. Okay, um, well, Nancy, thank you for a wonderful talk and a Sorry, presentation. Can I, can I just say, I'm just reading the us. chat here. Is it, you didn't actually see Arnold Schwarzenegger, you just heard him, is that correct? Yes, yeah. I'm so sorry. Good. This is like where my tech savvy is, I have a limit to my tech savvy, so I apologize for that. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. But we heard the Any message. Yeah, his message was loud and clear. 
So um, just to, to let you know a couple of things that have been happening, that the team worked together this week to start planning for the year as we promised you that we would. Um, and what we've done is we've actually planned for two weeks just to see how it goes and then we will review it and carry on or adapt as necessary. But I will be sending out or Amanda will be sending out um, a list of of what's on at CJSA from next Monday, the 18th till the end of the month. Um, and every day there will be at least two activities. Please feel free to join if you want to, but don't feel pressurized. It's what you want to be part of and we'd love to have you. So I'll just give you a, a bit of a, a background is that every Monday morning at nine o'clock, there are exercises with Joycelyn and this coming Monday, which is the 18th at 11 o'clock, our new social worker, Rebecca, has organized a quiz. So we will have a quiz on, 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 um, on Monday morning, the 11th. You'll all be doing it from your own home, so make sure you've got pencil and paper, but log on and we'll have a fun morning. Tuesday, on, on that's the 19th, West Coast are going to have a social morning at 11.30, um, Southern Suburbs open their library, but it's under strict con um, uh, conditions and you need to phone to book to go to the library. And then at one o'clock on Tuesday, the UK program, which Amanda will send out every week, it's different and it's, it, it's an, a very, very interesting hour. Wednesday morning is Ageless Grace with Yvonne and we'd love more people to join up. And we're going to try on Wednesday afternoon there are numerous people right around the peninsula who've been knitting throughout lockdown as we used to have knitting circles. We're now going to log on and have the knitting circle um, online so that you'll be able to zoom in and chat to one another while you're knitting. And we will give that a try for an hour on Wednesday. Next Thursday morning is our pop-in. And in the afternoon, also as a trial, number of people have been asking about Kaluki. So if you log on, we will make different rooms, breakout rooms so that you can play Kaluki. And then next Friday, hopefully, we will have the first of our Yiddish classes. And that will be at 10 a.m. And then at one o'clock on the Friday is another UK program, which will be sent to us from the United, from the United Kingdom. The other thing that I did ask um, Dr. Ellen Putterman has agreed to talk to us on medical aids and the problems that we have with medical aids, but he really does want questions that we have so that he can answer them when he comes on to the Zoom. So please, if you've got any questions regarding your medical aid or anything else, give them to the social workers so that we can send them to him so that we can set this program up. And then just last two things, the um, New Year's Eve concert that, that was beautiful and put on by Iva is now on YouTube. We've sent out the YouTube um, uh, login so you can all either re-watch it or watch it for the first time and have a wonderful two hours watching a fabulous show. And then just lastly, subs are due. Many people have already paid and for that we thank you, but they are staying at 180 Rand for the year and if you can see your way through, please, please pay your subs. Otherwise, um, we'll see you hopefully on Monday for Ageless Grace. And I will, uh, Amanda's put in the chat the YouTube link for Iva. And um, I will let you know when I send out the listing for next week who our guest speaker is going to be next at 10 a.m. next Thursday. But otherwise, stay safe, stay Stay in your houses as much as you can. And Nancy, thank you for giving us an hour of your time. Over to all of you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.